welcome to patna and uh, so we had a very vibrant uh, first day of the conference and we are looking forward for the second and the third day and uh, today in this hall we have we are diseases three free papers and uh, i would like to welcome my uh, co convener dr satyaprakash tiwari who is consultant at dishti punjaya hospital at patna and myself dr abhishek kedia may i request the first presenter for the day dr sumit randhir singh and to present his free paper on pigment epithelial detachment scarring index in neovascular age related macular degeneration Shall I start? Please keep in mind the timing because okay. it will be considered in point. All right. Okay. Shall I start then? Yes. Yeah, just give okay. a minute. Are we? Yeah. Please. Okay. So good morning to all. Excuse me. Excuse me. The paper is duration is five minutes. Please make the timer five minutes. Yeah. All the papers are five minutes. Please make timing as five minutes for all the papers. Okay. So good morning to all. At the outset, I would like to thank AIOC and BOS for giving me the opportunity to speak at this forum. So my topic for discussion today is longitudinal changes in pigment epithelial detachment scarring index, a new imaging biomarker in wet AMD. I don't have any financial disclosures. So this is the spectrum of AMD which we see in our clinical setting. on the top we see that the, there is presence of drusenoid pd and at the extreme end we have the presence of fibrous tissue somewhere in between we have presence of fibrovascular pd which is the hallmark of neovascular amd in which we have presence of subretinal fluid which we can see in the form of a cleft here and we have a fibrovascular pd among all these three the main point of differentiation is the reflectivity pattern in the oct which makes the clinician judge about the disease process So the aim of the present study was to evaluate a novel automated biomarker PEDC in the quantification of anti-VEGF related treatment effects and its assessment of disease activity in neovascular AMD. This was a retrospective analysis and we included treatment naive neovascular AMD eyes which received anti-VEGF treatment and considered only patients who had PED at baseline on the OCT. So BCVA and OCT images were taken at baseline 3 months, 6, 12, 18 and 24 months. CMT and SF SRF area were calculated directly from the OCT images and we used an automated image pro processing technique to classify the PEDC components into three that is the serous neovascular and the fibrous components and we did a longitudinal analysis of the PEDC and other OCT biomarkers so this is in brief how the image algorithm was used to classify the PED into three components so just to summarize the red component shows the serous the green the blue is the neovascular one and the green is the fibrous one so the pedc was calculated based upon the ratio that is fibrous upon the total pd area so on results we analyzed a total of 43 eyes the patients received a mean of 13 injections over the period of 24 months the bcva showed a slight worsening over 24 months that is there was an increase in the logmar by 0.07 through 24 months what we noted that the pedc also showed a reduction of 0.04 which was statistically significant PEDC therefore showed a weak negative correlation with the BCVA in logmar units so these were the other parameters which were analyzed apart from CMT sub foveal choroidal thickness we also noted that the PED area that the, that is the total PED area showed an increase over 2 years that is it increased from 0.38 to 0.47 this graph also shows the changes in the multiple OCT uh, parameters the purple color line if you can see we see that the PED area increases on the other hand the pedc shown by the green line shows that it de slightly decreased over time through 24 months this is one of the representative images on the oct if we see that there is a presence of hyporeflective area which the algorithm picked as serous component so it it is shown as red on the other hand at 12 months follow up the bcva with treatment improved to 2025 and there was an increase in the pedc score so the green component shows the scarring index as 0.823 
these are some of the other patients in which we see that over time the in patient A the over time the vision deteriorated over 24 months the PET C however also reduced from 0.45 to 0.17 patient B we see that the vision increased from 2200 to 2070 here the PET C was very minimal 0.027 to 0.087 patient C there was a improvement in vision PET C from 0.025 it increased to 0.627 in the green component shown in the figure C there are severe limitations with the study we also know that there are issues with the quality and the variability of OCT images the algorithm basically used the pixel intensities to classify the PEDs into three components so we see that there is a significant amount of overlap between the serous and the neovascular component so the issues what we face clinically the algorithm also had similar issues then there are issues with the smaller PEDs that quantification of the PED size becomes a challenge PED again we should know that it's a ratio so even if the total PED area increases the PED ratio keeps on changing and uh, we are hoping to get a better name for this because the PET-C with improvement in vision we are getting to see the improvement in PET-C scores as well however on the as the name suggests the scarring the vision should deteriorate so just to conclude this is a longitudinal analysis of PET-C which supports its utility as a biomarker by quantifying the amount of scarring within the PEDs and the correlation of PET-C with visual acuity is comparable to the other bio imaging biomarkers such as CMT and SFCT. Thank you. Uh, nice study. Uh, Sumit, I uh, have two questions. Yeah. One is what is the algorithm that you used? To uh, this was uh, an algorithm in which uh, based on the imaging kernels, based on the pixel intensities, we classified the PED into three components. What the software was it? Uh, I, it's it's actually made by the engineers themselves, IIT Hyderabad engineers. Okay. So, so you, you don't, they have not given a name uh, to the... It's uh, not given a name, but it's uh, from What software or what did they use? So was it uh, based like an image software or did they have some other proprietary way in which they find out, find it out better than the other softwares? Uh, but the reason why I'm asking you is, see with the fibrous component, you can also have a conflicting thing with hemorrhage. What if there's a thick hemorrhage? How do you differentiate between a you know, fresh thick hemorrhage and a fibrosis. Yeah, this is a challenge which he had suffered initially also. So we tried to exclude all those patients who had significant like PCV kind of picture. Mm. Those patients we had excluded because the algorithm we were having difficulty trying to classify them into these three components. Yeah, so, so any we, massive hemorrhage you have not taken at We all. have not taken. And even if there is a thin sliver of hemorrhage, were you able to differentiate between a hemorrhage and a fibrosis? Uh, no, that, that's what was the concern because the algorithm, it was not able to clearly it delineate the three it. components. So what is your final take home message that fibrosis actually denotes better visual acuity at the end of it uh, or um, not? Being a ratio, I think because the increase in PED area was also present, so it uh, just mixed, the, the picture became confusing. So I think uh, the absolute fibrosis area would be a better uh, marker. So there are a lot of confounding factors here because we have to take into component the atrophy. Yeah. the duration or the number of injections because we know with repeated injections the atrophy actually At worsens. worsens that yeah. will again have a bearing on the vision anyway it's a good attempt uh, because you have at least looked at a new parameter that we can check and going forward hopefully with improvement in the algorithms we might actually get out something thank you okay. thank you so the next presenter is dr Sivani sina she'll be presenting on clinical and biochemical characteristics of patients with vascular occlusions in post covid 19 rocm uh, good morning all. I will be presenting on clinical and biochemical characteristic of patients with vascular occlusions in post-COVID-19 ROCM. So as we all know, ROCM in COVID-19 patient was a devastating complications associated with vascular occlusion. So the aim of the study was to evaluate the clinical and biochemical characteristic of patients with vascular occlusion in post-COVID-19 ROCM. So it was a retrospective study taken at a COVID-19 dedicated tertiary care center. And 22 patients with vascular occlusion in post-COVID-19 stage 3C and 4 were included in the study. It uh, included uh, parameters, clinical parameters and the biochemical parameters which included the inflammatory uh, parameters like neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, lymphocyte to CRP ratio and serum ferritin. So 22 patients either developed or presented with vascular occlusion during the course of hospital stay uh, during the ROCM treatment. 17 patients had pre-existing uh, vascular occlusion, while one developed ophthalmic artery occlusion, secondary to uh, uh, surgery. One patient with stage 4D had bilateral central retinal artery occlusion. 
So 18% of all the hospital admissions regarding COVID, post COVID-19 ROCM patients had vascular occlusion, out of whom 82% had stage 3C uh, ROCM. So it had a male uh, predominance and the mean duration of presentation after COVID-19 was three weeks. So 21 patients had presented with a negative perception of light at presentation and one patient with BRAO had a uh, vision of a counting finger of four meters. Almost all the patients had uh, ophthalmoplegia. Four patients had presented with CRAO, one with combined vascular occlusion, one with BRAO and 16 with ophthalmic artery occlusion. All the parameters were deranged in these patients. When we compared stage three patients with occlusion uh, with stage three patients without occlusion, that is th uh, stage three A and three B, there was no significant difference between the biochemical uh, parameters. This is a fundus photo showing uh, right eye combined uh, occlusion with neovascularization of the disc. And the same uh, patient had a florid neovascularization on o OCTA and a thinning of the uh, retinal layers in, on OCT. Uh, the same patient had a normal internal carotid artery uh, with normal branches. This is a patient showing a superior uh, branch retinal artery occlusion in the right eye with a normal left eye. The, this patient shows a uh, left eye central retinal artery occlusion with a cherry red spot with a pale disc. The, the, this shows a left eye ophthalmic artery occlusion. Uh, so 18 patients underwent uh, sino uh, nasal or vital uh, debride, uh, debridement with three patients uh, undergoing exenteration. Two of the patients with stage 4D died. And at four weeks, none of the pa uh, only one patient improved in uh, uh, visual activity uh, who had BRAO. So, uh, uh, isolated ophthalmic artery occlusion with or vital infarction syndrome have been reported in post-COVID-19 patients. CRO is a comparatively rare manifestation with uh, 16 to 20% prevalence, and it results due to contiguous spread of angioinvasive fungal infection uh, because of necrotizing vasculitis and thrombosis of the central retinal artery or due to the thrombosis of the internal carotid artery. So these are some of the papers which highlight the uh, uh, occlusions with invasive ROCM in post-COVID-19 patients. So in our subset of patients, approximately 73% of the patient developed ophthalmic artery occlusion, whereas 18% had CRAO and 8% each had combined vascular occlusion and BRAO. So the blood sugar and the inflammatory uh, markers were similar in post-COVID-19 stage 3C ROCM patients with and without vascular occlusion. So uh, basically it can be attributed to the angio, angio invasion rather than just being uh, contributed uh, uh, solely by the inflammatory biomarkers. So uh, to conclude, this is the largest set of patients reported to develop vascular occlusion post-COVID-19 ROCM, and uh, angio-invasive fungal infection from the orbit uh, is responsible for vascular occlusion rather than the high inflammatory markers. The limitation was the retrospective nature and lack of uh, more of uh, inflammatory parameters in these cases and uh, lack of uh, MRA in every case. It had a relatively shorter follow and uh, strength being the largest case series of retinal vascular occlusions. So to take home, miss, uh, this can be relevant in making both ophthalmologists and physicians treating post-COVID-19 ROCM patients uh, more aware of this uncommon possible devastating complication. Thank you. Thank you, Sivan. So first off, first I would like to congratulate you uh, on working of these patients in the devastating times. Uh, Sivani, like, uh, other than the angio-invasive nature, do you think this study or this retrospective study will help us in future in any way? Uh, uh, sir, uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, many papers came out with uh, uh, occlusions with uh, COVID-19 also, like uh, uh, high inflammatory uh, markers. And uh, so we have to think of uh, ROCM um, uh, contributing to the factors rather than just attributing everything to the COVID. So it was more of ROCM, and we have to take help of ancillary treatments like uh, we were using a retrobulbar tram in these patients so as to avoid uh, exenteration in them. So uh, if a patient, and uh, most of the patients were PL negative, so we do not have to go for exenteration straight away in these patients. We can salvage the eyes uh, rather than uh, just uh, keep on exenterating them. Thank you. Can, I, can we have Dr. Anand Sanan, please? Dr. 
Dr. Anand will be speaking on efficacy of oral epinone for the treatment of chronic CSC. Timer, please. Uh, uh, receptor activation in choroidal vessel may involve in the pathogenesis of CSCR. Therefore, use of MRN antagonist such as epilinoid treatment of choice uh, in the patient with CSCR. Uh, aim of the study is to evaluate efficacy of epilinoid in mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, a potassium sparing diuretic treatment option in chronic center serous retinopathy. After departmental review of committee of approval retrospective analysis, it is conducted uh, for a patient who received off level of In uh, patient uh, taking 45 uh, to 50 milligram per day uh, uh, in CSCR. Exclusion criteria, history of RVO, diabetic retinopathy, and exudative IAM, diabetic metalloidema. Mm, approved level dose of epinone in hypertension is 50 mg. Uh, per day adverse effect include uh, hyperkalemia, hypercholesterolemia, and hypertriglyceridemia, indigenous headache, albuminuria, abdominal pain, diarrhea, milk anemia, LTST, necrosis. Primary outcome by measure decrease SRI fight and diameter 90 day after initiation of therapy. Secondary outcome measure log mire visual equity and CMT and average retinal thickness. A statical uh, method uh, because of uh, retrospective uh, nature, uh, it is divided into four frame baseline 1 to 90 day, 91 to 181 day, 181 to plus day, uh, which had more than one time frame of uh, some subjects have more than one time of frame um, 29 day and 71 day. Outcome value measure in the middle of the each time 45, 136, and 240 day. Mixed model of U to assess uh, the effect of time between subject and test. The method outcome over time, the time effect report for frame related within overall effect significant. An analysis of overall time effect. Uh, um, SRF uh, height and diameter, CMT log transformed into analysis. Uh, result what um, uh, log mire uh, visual equity improved from uh, 0.4 uh, to uh, uh, study outcome in uh, 0.29 and uh, Stella equivalent to uh, 2553 and improved to after a study completion of 20 uh, Y39. Uh, central macular thickness was increased, uh, uh, decreased uh, from uh, 339 to 269.3 micron and uh, macular cube thickness 312 uh, micron uh, to 279 and cube volume by 11.2 millimeter uh, cube uh, from 10.2. Uh, um, uh, uh, SRF from 130.5 to 45.5. Uh, this is uh, graphical representation and uh, some patients have uh, 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 SR, uh, uh, central macular thickness uh, from uh, 417 to uh, 3175. Discussion, this uh, the series uh, of patients treated with 25 to uh, 50 milligram or the oral epidemiologic chronic CSCR, statically significant reduction in 
uh, SRFI and CMT, significant decrease by 10% first follow up from baseline. P value 0.048, uh, P value uh, significance uh, from the P, uh, 0 0.024 to 0 0.007. Um, uh, SQ average thickness does not decrease, which, which is not significant. P value greater than 0 0.05. Uh, result of this study uh, suggested that oral capillary may be effective in treatment of CSR and should be investigated potential treatment choice of uh, chronic CSR. Similar study. Uh, uh, time is up. Time is up. If you want to go to the conclusion slide, please conclude this. Uh, Epilinone therapy may improve BCVA um, and decrease CMT and SRF uh, uh, in patients with chronic CS. So it is another option, safe, um, non-invasive effective method for treatment of chronic CS. Yeah. Yes. So you have not really told us what are the I request all the next presenters to be ready with their presentation. Is Dr. Rajiv Prezer here? Yes. Please come class. Yes, sir. Sir, both presentation are...
गुड मॉर्निंग सर एंड गुड मॉर्निंग या सर आई एम प्रेजेंटिंग द केस केस विच इज द कोराडल न्यू वेस्कुलर मेम्ब्रेन फॉलोइंग द इंडोजीनस ऑफ द एंड ऑफ थेलमेटिस विद सबरेटिनल एब्सेस कॉज्ड बाय सीरो सीरोस्पोरियम एपियोस्पर्मम फंगस सो हियर वी आर रिपोर्टिंग अ केस विच इज द एंडोजीनस एंड ऑफ थेलमेटिस विद सबरेटिनल एब्सेस ड्यू टू द सीरोस्पोरियम एपियोस्पर्म इन इन एन इम्यूनो कॉम्पिटेंट इंडिविजुअल so patient was presented to us with a sudden diminution of vision in left eye at presentation the best corrected vision was 69 n8 snellens and fundus examination showed minimal vitreous haze and subretinal abscess in the left eye and this was the picture of fundus at the presentation in the left eye ac tap and culture was negative after 72 hours and the pcr for the ac tap was also negative so we have started the intravitreal ceftazidime and vancomycin and the symptom uh, systematically patient was treated with cefotaxime and uh, uh, iv amikacin then we did the because the patient was not improving so we did the vitreous uh, biopsy and the uh, it came positive for the pan fungal genome and the culture of vitreous biopsy which came as a positive uh, pseudosporium uh, which was isolated after 8 day so uh, we give we had given the intravitreal voriconazole 50 microgram and also started the systemic oral voriconazole 400 mg bd and the baseline uh, liver function test was done which was normal so we have started the 400 mg voriconazole and this was the second week picture of fundus For second week it was improving then at the third week again it was uh, the confluent and uh, vitreous haze were more of fourth week uh, so again fourth week it was improving and the vision was also started to improve the patient again came after uh, patient was till then under follow up then patient came on the sixth month with uh, a sudden diminution of vision sorry sir yeah patient this is Please continue. Patient came at the seven month, with, uh, six months with a diminution of vision, and that time uh, patient has developed the uh, CNVM. So we give we had given the three monthly injection of uh, ranibizumab, and uh, this is the uh, 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 OCT picture after the first injection at seven month, and second this is the. Uh, eight month picture and this is the nine month picture and this is the final picture the tenth month the vision was uh, 660 and 24 and uh, at 12 month vision was stabilized to the 624 and n18 so patient this case is unique as patient received the multiple uh, injection of uh, antifungal voriconazole and it developed in the immun immunocompetent patient and subsequently patient had developed cnvm which was managed and the patient achieved the visual acuity of 618 and 18 in the left eye thank you sir this was the my first presentation you still have time why did you conclude uh, sir this sir please go to conclusion slide yes it just started ma'am so the uh, that uh, uh, that what is what do you see inferior to the macular why is the visibility so hazy there what is that it's like uh, ma'am there was some hemorrhage like thing that was 
at CNVM Cambridge. That's separating language. Uh, yeah. No, ma'am, separating language. So even with separating language, you should be able to see the difference. The reason why I'm asking you is since this is not a straightforward case of the CNVM, yes, ma'am. It's a post-inflammatory, and I think that you would have given us a little bit more detail as to the extent of the disease, how much is the fibrosis versus an active memory mm-hmm. to help plan. Uh, Ma'am, uh, because this patient uh, developed the endogenous ma'am, the endogenous, uh, and that is the way, and it, this is the uh, patient is not immunocompromised. The okay, post-inflammatory CNVMs are common irrespective of uh, yes, immunocompromised or not. You see a lot of uh, patients with uh, inflammation. Yes, inflammatory CNVM is common. So the patient only received three uh, no ma'am, still no patient is stable ma'am, uh, only 3 injection of ranibidumab. What do you think is the reason for the decreased vision? Why is it at 6, 6, why is it 6, 18? Uh, ma'am, so actually uh, uh, there is a uh, epiretinal membrane and now that uh, patient has developed uh, lamellar macular hole also ma'am. Thank you. Thank you Rajiv. Yes, thank you. Uh, Please continue with the second presentation. Second. Yes. Medical management of hypotony due to cyclodialysis left following cathode surgery. Uh, sir, uh, I'm, uh, we are reporting a case of uh, medical management of hypotony due to cyclodialysis cleft, uh, which happened after the cataract surgery. So we have, we have a patient, 50-year-old male gentleman, which came to us with a gradual diminution of vision uh, in right eye since four years following cataract surgery, and uh, for that he was uh, uh, for that he was uh, intermittently given steroid eye drop, uh, and he was on steroid eye drop on and off since four years at presentation vision in the right eye was counting finger two meter uh, with uh, plus four spherical addition and uh, on examination anterior chamber was quite IOL was in place and anterior chamber was deep intraocular pressure recorded at the time of presentation was six millimeter of mercury as compared to the left eye which was uh, uh, as compared to the right eye which was 18 uh, millimeter of mercury fundus examination showed attached retina multiple choroidal fold uh, disc edema and uh, peripheral shallow choroidal detachment and the ubm showed the cyclodialysis cleft and uh, we did the oct macula which showed the choroidal detachment and multiple folds so uh, af- we had started the patient on uh, atropine one percent for three times per day and after the one month uh, this is the picture of fundus and uh, this is the picture of uh, this is the OCT macula picture and uh, we continued the treatment for uh, still patient is on treatment and uh, this is the picture at four months and uh, this is the picture of uh, CT macula and the uh, vision uh, was improved uh, to 636 after four months of treatment and IOP was recorded as 12 millimeter of mercury after the four months. So uh, I conclu- this conclusion is the atropine sulfate is the conservative uh, management in case of cyclodialysis cleft post uh, surgery. Why not a B-scan for us? Why OCT Ma'am, B scan, uh, ma'am, cyclodialysis cleft, ma'am. Uh, no, I'm not talking about the cleft. The cleft, yes, UVM have done. But why aren't we documenting uh, choroidal detachment or series or fluid on the B scan? Why are we using OCT? Because, you know, if suppose a posture pole is not involved, mm-hmm. that means you can't document the uh, series, right? So B scan will give you a more global uh, detection. I'm, I'm just curious yeah. to know why OCT and not uh, B scan for series. Ma'am, actually, uh, clinically, ma'am, it was evident that uh, macular uh, hypotony and uh, was there, so. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Rawson, please be ready with uh, your presentation once it comes to conclusion slides. Timer, please.
established fact and it is a works in uh, RBOs, BRBOs, CRBO, and it is being used for decades. So whenever we plan, your study was direct, a prospective study, no? interventional study. So whenever we plan interventional study, we must have some question in my mind. E even if it is established fact that you think that some question left unanswered, then we generally plan and study and do. But this is a well-known fact, so I think there is nothing new in your study. Before planning any study, the aim of the study should be clear. This is already a very proven fact that this works. You should do something different. No, but Archana, that is a very well-known fact. We have been doing that for almost more than a decade now. Thank you. Now we have Dr. Rosan Kumar who will be presenting on the emerging culprit of post-operative cl cluster and ophthalmitis in Eastern India. Timer, please. A very good morning to all of you. My topic is emerging culprit of post-operative cluster endophthalmitis in Eastern India, Acinato vector bobini. I don't have any financial disclosure to comment. Endophthalmitis is a serious and vision-threatening complication encountered after intraocular surgery. Cluster infection is defined as the occurrence of two or more than two infections in a single day from one theater or the occurrence of repeated post-operative infection. The incidence of post-cataract surgery infection worldwide is 0.04 to 0.2 percent. Predisposing factors include uncontrolled diabetes, prolonged operative time, or complicated surgery and breach of sterility protocols. We hereby report the clinical profile, etiology, management, outcomes, and drug sensitivity in Acinetobacter bomini cluster endophthalmitis. Three males and one female presented to our clinic with chief complaints of pain, redness and watering associated with loss of vision in operated eye after cataract surgery done five days back elsewhere. Vision in operated eye in case 1 and case 2 was no perception of light and in case 3 and 4 was perception of light present with inaccurate PR. Anterior segment Finding in case 1 and 2 was total hypopion and in case 3 and 4 was cells 4 plus and fibrinous membrane. So case 1 and 2 was diagnosed as panophthalmitis and case 3 and 4 was diagnosed as endophthalmitis. In all four cases, I did core vitrectomy with vitreous biopsy and intravitreal vancomycin, ceftazidim and dexamethasone was injected. In all cases, Acinetobacter baumini sensitive to amikacin was cultured from the vitreous biopsy. Subsequently, two cases of panophthalmitis were not, not intervened owing to explain nil visual prognosis and ended in thysis bulbi and rest two cases of endophthalmitis underwent repeat intravitreal antibiotics including amikacin. Contralateral eye of case 1 underwent pen retinal photocoagulation with glycemic control with explained guarded visual prognosis and the contralateral eyes of other cases were operated by FACO emulsification with PCIOL with good visual eye outcome. Acinetobacter baumini is gram-negative bacteridium. It is prevalent in hospital settings, especially in immunocompromised and chronic lung disease and diabetic patients. It is spread through direct contact with surfaces, objects, and the skin of contaminated sun. Our case series presented four cases of endophthalmitis caused by Acinetobacter, which itself is not commonly reported in literature, and the occurrence of its species A. baumini is even rarer. Pervarius et al. reported a case of endophthalmitis by this organism as the first clinical presentation of diabetes mellitus, which was found sensitive to cholestine. Vitrigen et al. have also reported one such case, which had to undergo vitrectomy 10 days after attract surgery, but had good visual outcome. Only one case series of four cases from Eastern India was found in literature, which was reported in 2009 to 11 by Ra et al. In this series, all the organisms were sensitive to ciprofloxacin and resistant to ceftazidim. Based on their findings, they commented that ciprofloxacin should be considered as first-line antibiotic in a bomini endophthalmitis. However, our isolates shows a different pattern of antibiotic sensitivity 
the occurrence of this atypical organism in our isolates implies that a bovini is an emerging culprit of post-operative cluster endophthalmitis in eastern India, wherein amicacin should now be considered a first-line drug in addition to ciprofloxacin. Two of our patients had uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension, hence the role of systemic control for the prevention of endophthalmitis and thorough preoperative preparation cannot be overemphasized. Endophthalmitis should be differentiated from TAS also. So my take-home message will be a bovini is a very rare cause of common source endophthalmitis which needs close epidemiologic monitoring with poor visual and anatomical outcomes, hence prevention is key. Management of endophthalmitis includes immediate intravitreal antibiotics and timely referral to higher center for vitro-retinal intervention. Amicacin should be considered as first line in sensitive acinetobacter bomini isolates. Thank you so much. Sir, uh, actually, uh, uh, representatives from uh, that center uh, came to me repeatedly. I asked them also uh, regarding the source of infection, but uh, uh, they didn't take any action uh, to investigate actually, that thing. Actually, it should be emphasized to the, any, any hospital, if it ends up having some uh, cluster and ophthalmitis, then a thorough outlook into the operation theater and drugs used, we should try to find out the cause. because. If we try to nab the cause, then it can prevent the future recurrence of similar episodes in any hospital. Anyway, very good presentation. Thank you so much. No, I did vitrectomy in all four patients. Actually, uh, two was panophthalmitis, so I did uh, core vitrectomy blindly. And uh, in complete vitrectomy. No. Just I uh, left uh, the I VSS field. And you used uh, DEXA for all of the demonstrations? Yes. That was even before your culture came or after the culture came? Uh, pardon, ma'am? Did you use the DEXA before your culture no, uh, came or after? No, in first sitting only I uh, put DEXA. Vancos after as well as DEXA methashon. Uh, so first you have to rule out uh, the underlying organism, preferably removing the DEXA. Uh, yeah, there is remote possibility of uh, a fund fungal endophthalmitis also. In that case, uh, dexamethasone may uh, worsen the, your outcome. But uh, uh, the condition was uh, uh, clinically, it was looking like a bac uh, bacterial uh, pathology. So I uh, injected dexamethasone in first setting. And uh, when culture uh, came, came out to be acinetobacter bomini, then I uh, repeated intravital injection, including amikacin as it was thoroughly uh, sensitive in all four cases. One more important point is to check the concentration of amicacin in post vitrectomized eye. You have to reduce the concentration because many a times if the prognosis is a little bit better, infection gets controlled, uh, original concentration of amicacin may lead to macular infarcts and we have seen few cases of... Uh, yeah, uh, amicacin has macular toxicity as well. Vitrectomized eye, I think the dose is 400 micron. Yes, sir. And in vitrectomized eye, it should be reduced to 100 or 200. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Is this organism sensitive to any other drug? Uh, actually, uh, uh, meropenam, uh, uh, carbapenam, it was sensitive. And it was resistant to uh, main drug like ceftazidine, ciprofloxacin. So that's why I added amikacin intravitrally after once uh, that biopsy report came. Nice presentation, Dr. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. May I request all the speakers to please come on the dais for the photograph. <laughs> 